Okay, everyone. So in this next chapter, we're going to talk about uh, the universe, and this is going to kind of start a few chapters about um, space and things in general um, and astronomy. Um, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about, um, as you'll likely see as we go through some of these lectures. Um, if you have questions or anything, um, or if you just want some more information about anything that I talk about uh, over the next few chapters, feel free to ask. Um, I've taught entire courses on astronomy before. Um, I'm just going to kind of delve into uh, the important stuff over the, the next few weeks. Um, but I want you to definitely be able to look into more stuff if you want to. Um, so here we're just going to go through this chapter. You'll find um, this week that I've attached um, some additional videos on uh, topics. Uh, the ones from Crash Course Astronomy are really, really good. Um, there's a whole a whole 45 some odd video lectures um, on that channel on YouTube. I, I really encourage you to watch it. Um, the one I've attached this week is related to stars, but there are others that relate to galaxies and, and um, such that, that would be um, useful when we talk about this chapter. Um, and there are others that will be useful as we talk about the next few chapters. But in this chapter, we're primarily going to talk about <clears throat> first, kind of what we can see from Earth and, and why it, why that is the way it is, um, and then we'll get into um, the ideas of stars themselves, um, and a little bit into cosmology, where we talk about the beginning and the end of the universe, essentially. Um, again, this is the kind of thing where I could sit and chat with you about this um, for a while and uh, still not cover everything that I think of. So um, we're just going to go from here and, and uh, get more information as time comes along. So, um, in this chapter, we're going to talk about the stars that you can see um, in the sky. Right? And even the ones you see at night, no matter how many you see, there are billions and billions more that you can't see. One really interesting thing you can do if you have any access to a telescope um, is on a dark night, just point it to a dark point in the spot in the sky and look through the telescope. Because where you might see one star without it, you could see hundreds with it. And you can do it, but you don't even need necessarily a telescope. You can do it with binoculars too. Um, anything that will essentially extend your field of vision, like a telescope or binoculars, will allow you to um, view more stars in any region of the sky than you can see without with, with just your naked eye. Um, another thing is, uh, in the Muscle Shoals Florence area, if I remember correctly, is not the best spot for um, viewing the sky. Lots of light pollution. Anytime you're around a big city or big cities, um, any type of light is going to keep you from seeing the sky. Where I currently live, um, where I moved after I lived in Florence, um, I live in a somewhat rural area. And so if I go outside at night or onto my back porch, um, it is relatively dark and I can see the sky pretty well. And even when I can, I can still only see maybe hundreds of stars in the sky. And even when I pull out my telescope at home, I can look at one point and see a whole bunch that I couldn't see without it. So there's a lot more there than what you can see, for sure. Um, now, aside from the stars that we see outside, you know, far away, there's one that's really close, and it's the sun. Okay, The sun is a star. It is the closest star to the Earth. If I ask you what is the closest star to the Earth, you should know that it is the sun. Okay, um, don't let that confuse you. The sun, in general, um, as you'll see as we go through this chapter, the sun is a basically normal, average star. It's it's uh, just about everything about it is average. Um, and because of that, we exist. If it was, if it was not an average star, as you'll see, then it wouldn't be able to sustain life on a planet that orbited around it. 
So we're going to talk about how we observe the night sky and how we see um, these different stars and things like that. We have to go back, way back, to early, early before telescopes and things like that. If you think back, or if you if you can imagine with me for a moment, you live in, I don't know, somewhere in the Middle East or Europe, well back in ancient times. No electricity, no televisions, definitely no cell phones. What do you do at night? Well, you go outside and you look up. And when you look up, you see all these bright, shiny objects in the sky. Right? At those times, you still would have seen a ton of stars with zero light pollution. So you could have seen so much. Right? And, and ancient civilizations noticed this. If you go back and look um, astronomy and understanding the stars and the sun and the motion of the planets, this was something that was looked at and attempted to be understood for, by different civilizations over hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, now, when you look up in the night sky, uh, you can see a few things. Right? First of all, you can see stars. Stars are apparently pretty easy to see. Those stars appear as point sources. Sometimes they appear to twinkle. Sometimes they appear to be different colors. Sometimes they appear to kind of switch between colors. Right? But they appear as points in the sky. Um, you know, you could essentially point them out in different places. Now, when you see stars that twinkle in the sky, that twinkling is generally due to atmospheric effects where you see the light from that star passing through the air and such in the atmosphere. And so as it gets to you, the air motion and things like that causes that light to just seem like it flickers just a little bit, so the stars twinkle. The stars that appear to change colors are super interesting um, because those are generally binary stars that are orbiting each other, um, causing that color change. I'm trying to think of the one that does it all the time. I can't think of the name off the top of my head. Um, finally, when we measure the distance to stars or anything outside of the solar system, planetary distances or, or distances in general, um, when we talk about distance in space, we, ref we use meters when we're on the Earth. Right? And in general, we use kilometers when we're talking about going to the moon. When we want to step out into the solar system, we use a different type of unit They're, that are known as astronomical units. Astronomical units represent the distance from, or the average distance from, the sun to the Earth. And so when we measure things in astronomical units, we're measuring things in Earth-Sun distances. And so the distance from the sun to the Earth would be 1 AU. The distance from the sun to Jupiter, I believe, is like 5 AU. It's five times further than the Earth. If you want to step outside of the solar system and measure the distance to other stars, then we use a measurement known as light years. And a light year is essentially the distance that light can travel in a year. Um, you can see there on the slide it's 9.5 times 10 to the 12 kilometers, um, which is 9.5 times 10 to the 15th meters. Okay, so that's 9 with essentially 15 zeros after it. And that's how many meters light can travel in a year. So we're talking about stars that are nearby, or even just stars out in the galaxy, our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. Um, we can measure the distance to the stars in light years. If we want to step any further than that, we use a unit called parsecs. And a parsec is just a, um, it's essentially equal to 3.26 light years. Okay, it's three times, or three point three and a quarter times the distance of a light year. And we just use that to measure the distances to even further objects. Um, the word parsec means parallax second. That means nothing to you. It just has to do with how we measure the distance to those far stars. Now, the only reason I even mentioned that unit is because if any of you are Star Wars fans, in the first Star Wars movie, Han Solo refers to um, making the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs. Okay? Makes it sound like it's time. Pretty sure George Lucas didn't understand that it was a measurement of distance. Um, I believe in the newer movies they tried to correct that. 
Um, or maybe in the solo movie they try to correct it. But um, that is a very glaring um, mistake that, you know, will drive physicists mad, but most other people don't understand what a parsec is. Um, so parsec is a measure of distance, not time. And someone should have told George Lucas that before 1977. Regardless, you can see stars in the sky. But in addition to seeing stars in the sky, you can also see planets. Um, planets do not generate their own light. Stars do. Okay, we'll talk about how stars generate their own light in just a few minutes. But planets do not generate their own light. Planets are seen just like the moon does not generate its own light. Planets are seen by the reflection of light from the sun. The sun hits them, the light reflects off, and we can see them that way. Now, in ancient times, there's only so many things you can see in the sky, and it's true now, too. There's only so many things you can see in the sky with your eyes. Um, you can see the sun and the moon, and you can see Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. There's all the ones you can see with the naked eye. Can't see the rings on Saturn, can't see the fancy moons of Jupiter without a telescope, but you can see those planets. Okay. Um, Venus will look, will be generally low to the horizon and will be the brightest thing you'll see early in the morning or early in the evening. Jupiter, generally higher in the sky, but tends to be pretty bright. It'll rival Venus. Okay. And, and then it kind of steps down from there in terms of being able to spot the Mars looks red. Um, it looks clearly red. Um, the other way you can notice planets, and this is what led to trying to understand what happens as planets orbit the sun, but the other thing you notice is that planets move, and planets move a lot more than stars do. And so in ancient times, they noticed that these planets um, moved back and forth through the sky. Um, I, I believe it's the word. I believe it's the word planet that comes from um, a Latin word for the Latin word for wanderer. Uh, because they wandered through the sky um, as they were observed. And, you know, back then people didn't know what they were. Um, but you can observe this now. You can go outside at night and look and see, you know, where Mars or Jupiter or Venus is one night compared to a night a few days later. Um, <clears throat> so those are basically the two things you can really see with your naked eye. Um, Every once in a while, a comet, stuff like that. But in general, the things you can always see is you can always see stars, and you can always see planets. Now, just like we have a map that allows us to locate places on the surface of the Earth, when we talk about places on the surface of the Earth, we use coordinates like latitude and longitude. Latitude measures the, essentially the distance from the equator. Longitude measures the distance around from the prime meridian, which is, you know, somewhere in England. It's just a random place chosen as the zero point for longitude. Okay. Um, lines of latitude run east and west, measure north and south. Longitude lines run north and south and measure east and west. Now, that same way that we, we understand the idea of latitude and longitude, we use that to essentially map out what we can see in the sky by basically projecting those ideas into um, a surface outside of the Earth. Right? We call that the celestial sphere. Okay? And the celestial sphere has what we call the celestial equator that sits right above the Earth's equator. Right? It's essentially an imaginary line. Okay, and we have the north and south celestial poles, which sit above the north and south poles of the Earth. Okay, which means the celestial um, sphere is tilted just like the Earth is tilted. Okay. Um, but with these measurements, and with some angle measurements, we can determine a location in the sky to look. Um, So your textbook refers to them as the altitude angle and um, the azim azimuth angle. Okay, um, the azimuth angle being what measures from the celestial meridian, which sits right above um, the Earth's prime meridian, 
Um, and these angle measurements will take you right to where you need to go. Okay, the azimuth angle tells you how far to go around the Earth. The altitude angle essentially tells you which way or how far up to look. Um, there's other ways that these are measured. Um, sometimes using terms called right, ascens right ascension and declination. Okay, they're very similar to the altitude and azimuth angle. If you guys are at all familiar with math, it's a similarity between uh, rectangular and polar coordinates, essentially, which is a different way of measuring to the same point. If you're not familiar with that, it's just a different way of measuring to the same point, um, just a different coordinate system, if you will. Now, because of the way we set up the celestial sphere, we see that objects essentially in the sky will rotate about the north and south poles because that's what it looks like to us as we rotate and move around the sun. Okay. Um, one video I am going to post in this chapter is a video of what the earth would look like, or sorry, what the sky would look like if the earth was still and the sky was rotating. It's hard to explain. Um, but if you get vertigo, vertigo or anything like that, do not watch that video. It will, it can make you a little dizzy. Um, but it is very interesting to see. Um, for sure, it shows the sky, how it changes uh, if you kept the earth in place and let the sky rotate instead of the other way around. So once we figure out a way to essentially locate the stars that we're looking at, let's talk just a little bit about what stars actually are. Okay, so um, stars in general are just giant balls of gas. They're mostly hydrogen gas. Um, in most cases, somewhere between 70-ish percent hydrogen, somewhere around 28-ish percent helium, and then the rest is, is just extra stuff kind of laying around, water vapor, carbon dioxide, things like that. Um, leftovers in wherever that star forms. But what happens is you have essentially a, a ball of gas out in the middle of the universe. It's just kind of hanging out, right? So that gas may be gravitationally interacting with one another, but it may be in such a way that it's not really doing anything. Most of those forces have maybe canceled out. Um, but something causes a shock wave to move that material, and that allows that material to get a little closer together. And when it does, gravity can take over. And gravity can start to pull. And what happens is the mass inside that cloud starts to get closer and closer together and gravity will essentially attach, attach those pieces. Okay, and then that piece is a little bit bigger than the piece nearby. So gravity will pull the smaller piece closer to the bigger piece. And that process just snowballs, right? Over time, all of that gas starts to get pulled into this, uh, you know, very massive center where all this gravity is coming from. Um, we haven't talked in this class about what causes gravity, but gravity comes about from the presence of mass. So any two objects with mass experience a gravitational attraction. If one of those objects is heavier, like the Earth, then smaller objects like us will be attracted to it, and that's why we're held onto the Earth. Um, so as these gases combine, gravity pulls them together and holds them together. Um, That gas, over time, will form what's called a protostar. And a protostar is basically just a big ball of gas, but it's not emitting light yet. And it's just, it's just the ball of gas before it starts to emit light. Something has to happen for that light of a star to essentially turn on. And what that thing is, is thermonuclear fusion. So inside of a star, you have um, a lot of hydrogen, okay? Uh, I'm gonna shorten the explanation some, but when you take two um, atoms of hydrogen and force them together, you fuse them together, they form helium. But in the process, generate a, a significant amount of energy. One process of, 
reacting helium to, um, hydrogen to helium does not make a whole ton of energy, but that's just one set of atoms. When you have billions and billions of, set of that, sets of atoms, it generates a lot of energy, and that's why stars generate a lot of energy. But what happens inside of the star, inside of the protostar, is that gravity is pushing all of this stuff together. And if it pushes and pushes and pushes enough, and if that force gets great enough, two of those hydrogen atoms will fuse. And when those two hydrogen atoms fuse, they generate helium and put out some energy. That energy that gets put out will then cause the next two hydrogen atoms to fuse, and so on. And you wind up with essentially a chain reaction to the point where once thermonuclear fusion starts inside of the core of a star, the star will essentially turn on. That's when you start having the star produce light. And all stars produce light in the same way, by fusing hydrogen into helium. There's a process beyond that, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes, um, but they all start that same way, by fusing helium, I'm sorry, by fusing hydrogen into helium. Now the sun itself, uh, just like all other stars, fuses hydrogen into helium. Okay, but again, we'll, we'll see, the sun is relatively average. There's nothing really spectacular about it. Um, but we do use it because it's closest to us and it's easily accessible. We use it as a reference for other stars. So we compare other stars to the sun. Is it more massive or less massive than the sun? Is it hotter or colder than the sun? And so we use the sun as basically a, um, a measuring stick, if you will, to um, compare other objects. Now, um, all stars are going to be uh, built in a similar way. Okay, um, Inside the core of the stars, where you have the most dense region of uh, gases, this is where that nuclear fusion is occurring. Um, outside of the core, you have uh, what's called the radiation zone. Okay, And it says the radiation diffuses outward over millions of years. I'm going to explain this all to you in just a second. Beyond that, you have what's known as the convection zone, which is where you have all this mass moving and sinking, and you have lots of convection occurring on the surface. This is the, the unstable image you see of the sun's surface. That's the convection zone. You can see the convections moving around. There's lots of magnetic interactions and things like that. Um, the upper reaches of the convection zone is essentially the surface, or what we would consider the surface of the star. You couldn't stand on it because it's all gas, and you know it would incinerate you before you even get close to it. But um, if we, if it had a surface, that would be the surface. Okay, it would be at the outer edge of the convection zone. Um, and you have a sun, the sun's surface temperature somewhere around 6,000 Kelvin, um, which, to put that simply, is hot. Now, just a couple of, of things. The corona of the sun, um, that outside edge you see during a solar eclipse, hotter than the surface temperature. Also, the center of the Earth, hotter than the surface of the sun. Okay? Not hotter than the center of the sun, but hotter than the surface. Now, uh, this slide kind of goes through this in a strange way, um, but I want to just point something out that's that's really, really interesting. Um, inside the core of stars, hydrogen fuses to helium. When it does that, it releases energy. That energy is released in the form of what's called a photon. Photons are light particles, light energy. Okay, That's why we see the light from the sun. Now, those hydrogen and helium, I'm sorry, those hydrogen to helium interactions occur billions and billions of times every second. And they generate billions and billions of photons. Those photons have to make their way through the radiation zone in order to get out of the sun. And that's where some strange stuff happens. So those photons will get absorbed, readmitted, absorbed, readmitted by all sorts of different things um, inside that radiation zone and can wander around in that radiation zone for millions of years before they make it to the convection zone and make it to the surface of the sun. Once those millions of year old photons make it to the surface of the sun, it takes them eight minutes to get to the earth. And so every photon, every bit of light that you see from the sun was made millions of years ago and has just made its way out of the sun eight minutes before you saw it. So, um, like I was saying, the sun converts a whole bunch 
of matter into energy every year. Okay, um, 1.4 times 10 to the 17th kilograms. So that's a 1 with 17 zeros after it, essentially. Um, or 2,600, 6,000 pound SUVs. A bunch, a bunch of matter. Um, the sun itself is about 5 billion years old. We can figure that out from the mass of the sun. Um, and we can also figure out how much fuel the sun has left, which is for about another 5 billion years, right? The sun is essentially in its midlife right now. Um, we can determine how fast it's burning. We can determine how much stuff is there. And from that, figure out how quickly the sun will burn out. Now, here's where things get strange, and they don't always think about how it's, it's hard to consider how this would work. Um, but when you have a less massive star, so something smaller than the sun, a less massive star will let will live way longer than the sun. So sun's lifetime, maybe about 10 billion years, a less massive star could live on the order of trillions of years. And it's because a star that's less massive will burn hydrogen slower because there's less gravity pushing on the center of that star. Less stuff means less, less gravity at the center, which means a slower burn of hydrogen. By the same token, massive stars don't live that long at all because they're so massive, they burn through their fuel really quickly. So it actually turns out that less massive stars live longer than anything, and more massive stars don't live that long at all. 